Welcome back. It is the eve of CPI data. Tomorrow, CPI data comes out. We've got JP Morgan's estimates as well for uh, CPI, looking at a uh, 5% chance of a higher than 0.4% uh, month over month read with a 5% chance of a below 0.1. Uh, that means most people expect we're really looking for between, well, JP Morgan included, between 0.1 and 0.4, sitting somewhere around 45% between uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, 25% chance of 0.3 to 0.4, and 20% chance of 0.1 to 0.2. Uh, JP Morgan thinks the base case here is going to be between that 0.2 to 0.3 range. Uh, economists, though, right now rounding up that CPI core number to 0.3. Uh, and uh, when we zoom in on that number a little bit, we look at that survey a little bit, uh, most of the surveys are coming in at an average of about 0.25. There are uh, 63 estimates in. The range is anywhere between 0.1 to 0.3. Nobody's really expecting a 0.4. Uh, actually, when I say nobody really is, nobody actually is. There, there is nobody looking for a 0.4. So uh, 0.4 would definitely be a bad negative surprise tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, in 24 hours from now, we'll be covering that. Uh, JP Morgan thinks there's about a 30% chance we could get that kind of number. And it wouldn't be good. Uh, I think uh, I think markets will be very upset about that. Uh, and this talk about uh, resurging inflation might come back. Uh, and uh, more talk of a potential second wave of inflation. Uh, I will say, JP Morgan usually has a pretty interesting take here. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we get something in line with, uh, with JP Morgan's outlook here. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I really want to pay attention to is uh, what's going on or, or how, how the bond market reacts after CPI. If we get, let's say, that 0.3, the market is expecting, you know, 2, uh, 0.25 rounded up, is there a chance the bond market falls? Or uh, that is, uh, Treasury yields fall? Or is there a chance market's kind of like, yeah, we already knew it became in between 0.2 and 0.3. A lot of folks are wondering, is the market potentially thinking that inflation is over, but could they be wrong in the sense that inflation goes to 2% uh, as a base case consensus, but could the market be wrong that we actually end up getting a whole lot less or a whole lot more, right? That's the big question. Uh, yesterday, T.S. Lombard had a fantastic piece about disinflation potentially being where we actually go. Uh, their, uh, their article title or research headline was, uh, could the market be wrong again? And they talked all about how uh, they think markets could be wrong about inflation coming in at 2% uh, over the, this next year here. And instead, we could be facing deflation. So that was really interesting to see sort of that flip-flop. Uh, yesterday, we got a little bit of a sample of what a Bitcoin approval might look like, which uh, I thought was very interesting that uh, Bitcoin actually sold off before it, uh, came, it, it turned out that uh, the SEC quote unquote approval was was just a, uh, you know, a hack or, or compromise of some sort. Go over here to the approval time frame. Take a look at this. Uh, we got the uh, hacked uh, post that uh, Bitcoin was approved. Uh, let me uh, grab the exact time frames here. I think it was 11 minutes after the hour, if I have it remembered correctly or memorized correctly. But I will verify quickly since uh, the timing does matter. There it is. Yep, 11. It's approved. Okay, we don't find out the SEC account is hacked until 26 minutes later. Yeah. Well, that means Bitcoin actually fell. Uh, from roughly forty-six thousand seven to eight hundred dollars, fell all the way down to about forty-six thousand one hundred dollars, which isn't much. It's like six hundred dollar move, not much at all. Then, when it comes out that uh, the SEC account was hacked, uh, then Bitcoin falls further, and uh, and then sort of stabilizes. And uh, now we're actually stable down. Uh, let's see here. Let's go in the last hour. Yeah, look at that. Kind of straight down. Here was the drama yesterday. It's been roughly straight down since then. Uh, a lot of folks think the SEC had this post ready to go for tomorrow. Uh, actually, sorry, for today. And uh, maybe whoever 
you know, compromise the SEC account, just change the date. Uh, apparently, the SEC uh, may have gotten SIM swapped. Doesn't sound like they had any kind of security key or Google Auth set up, which is pretty surprising, uh, given that the SEC is all about security. Uh, so uh, definitely a little bit of a slap in the face to the SEC. Uh, a lot of people joking that the SEC is now going to have to investigate itself for market manipulation. Yeah. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, let's take a peek at... Ooh, let's see here. There we go. Let's take a peek at uh, what some of these uh, stock movers are doing. It looked like uh, Etsy was moving a little bit uh, to the downside here. I wanted to see potentially why. Let's find out. Let's see what early potential earnings or numbers we're getting. Etsy, Etsy. So, Etsy. No, Etsy just had a cut to neutral at Goldman with an $80 price target, so that's not much news. We have Lennar. Lennar is an interesting one. L Lennar, yesterday, increasing their dividend to $2 a share, plus announcing a $5 billion share, back authoriza share buyback authorization. Nice. Uh, Coinbase also trending down a little bit. Uh, that downtrend is beginning. I've been uh, pretty excited about going short this one. I think we talk about it almost every single day. Uh, so the question, I mean, what's fascinating is now you kind of have an idea of what's going to happen on Bitcoin approval for an ETF. Uh, looks like Bitcoin down is the reaction, uh, which uh, who knows if that'll, uh, you know, that's sort of getting priced in now where people are looking going, oh, okay, it's down. So therefore, you know, when it actually gets approved, it ends up going up. Uh, you know, who knows? I always find it really entertaining when uh, uh, trying to understand the market psychology. But I think a lot of people are going to be looking minute by minute going, okay, okay, okay. What did Bitcoin do? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin fell in the minutes after. Okay, okay. Well, maybe we want to uh, we wanna be out if uh, we get that approval today. Uh, today's that expiration to get a clean approval. We do think the approval will come today. Although it's just weird that yeah, we're at the day. So, we'll see. All right. Uh, then, uh, yesterday, we did uh, obviously have some red here in markets. Let's take a peek at this. Uh, first of all, uh, we'll look at the green. Uh, NVIDIA up 1.7%. Kind of sold off into the close. It was up higher than that. But uh, NVIDIA closed above its 500 number. This is a technical breakout for the stock. We've been watching that number for a while, and uh, sure enough, you know, now it's at 535. It's got a lot of technical support. Uh, NVIDIA did what Tesla could not. You had uh, Enphase up a little bit yesterday, about 1%, uh, along with uh, Alphabet and Amazon, Mobileye, uh, all of these up slightly yesterday, with uh, CrowdStrike also up nearly 5%. Let's take a peek at what happened with Crowd yesterday. Crowd strike. Uh, let's see. Crowd strike raised at Morgan Stanley on demand outlook. Uh, let's see. Uh, looks like it's just uh, price target changes over the past few days to three hundred dollars at UBS to two seventy four at Guggenheim, and then just an upgrade over there at Morgan Stanley. Okay, looking now at the other side. Uh, Jupiter down 11.4. I mean, that company is a scam, so that's not a surprise. Coinbase fell 4.6% yesterday. Wow, good drop there. Uh, Tesla down 2.28. Tesla's down there with Disney, Affirm, and SoFi. Uh, slightly more interest rate sensitive. Uh, rate cut evaluation stocks all down somewhere between 2 to 3%. Zim, uh, down 6%. Possibly on news that the United States, uh, gosh, I think I want to say it was like 20 drones or something like that, shot down 20 drones or rockets or something from Houthis. Yeah, here it is. Uh, American and British jets and warships shot down 18 drones and three anti-ship missiles around 9 p.m. local time. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's um, maybe that's a way of the U.S. finally saying, hey, don't, don't count us out. We're here. Uh, because I was pretty disappointed that Maersk had to sort of bail after 
a U.S. presence. That, that seemed a little disappointing. What do we have over here? Who is this? Uh, there's more than 3% inflation out there. So I, I think there's still inflation in the supply chain that hasn't come out. Um, I still see shortages, and there are shortages out there um, that are still being held up. So 3%, I think 3% is probably a pretty good number, kind of plateaus. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't be surprised if we had a couple of, of, of months with higher inflation in 24. I mean, you can see pressure points building, uh, like with the Red Sea and yeah. shipments having right. to go around the Cape of Good Hope, how that is going to add time and money to, right. to cost to companies at this point, too. It's interesting that it has, that hasn't been fully seen in oil prices. Um, not yet. But I was reading this morning, it's getting worse. So, you know, that's the kind of thing. There's so many unknowns next year. There's just so many things that the status quo, the most likely picture almost seems uh, unlikely. You know, Biden versus Trump, really? Um, you know, everything gets sorted out in the Middle East. Well, it doesn't. Uh, Russia, and, and it just keeps. This guy's skeptical that we'll have a Biden versus Trump. Interesting. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so. Whatever. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, what what other real information can we get here? Uh, let's see here. Okay. So, again, CPI tomorrow. That's going to be the big deal. Everybody's going to be paying attention to CPI. What is this? New York Fed president is scheduled. More interesting to conventional financial assets are the scheduled remarks from New York Fed president Williams this afternoon. Ooh. Williams talks this afternoon. I'm not sure what time. Let's see if we can find that out. Now, what's also interesting is you'll have another debate today. You'll have a DeSantis uh, Fed Williams speech today. So you'll have a DeSantis versus Haley debate today. So we'll cover that. And uh, you've got, uh, today is, let's see, Jan 10. Mm, well, we'll have to find out where he is. I'll, I'll find out where he is. But anyway, uh, so at some point we'll get some kind of drop of, of information from Williams. Uh, I, the market honestly hasn't been re reacting too terribly much from just randoms at uh, the Federal Reserve, you know, random other members dropping commentary uh it used to be a lot more sensitive but now people are just heavily hanging their hat on what jay powell says uh which makes sense he sort of uh leads everyone here uh and so that's not a surprise let's see statements uh, of course the next fed meeting is january 31st which uh which is really interesting because January 31st will be when they really have to start setting the stage for, okay, yeah, are we going to cut in March or not? Because if they if they plan to cut in March, uh, then, uh, then you'd think they'd want to start planting some seeds of that now, like January. Uh, and really, this next CPI data set will, will plant the seed for the Fed seed planting. Yeah, it's a lot of seed planting, I don't know to get a uh, final deal on funding the government. After a break, we're going to hear from Texas Republican Senator John Cornyn. Squawkbots coming right back. Nah. All right. So what else? Uh, Redfin down 6%. I wonder if something happened with Redfin. Uh, Redfin's super volume dependent. We expect volumes, not necessarily prices to move heavily this spring, but we expect volumes to move pretty heavily. Oh, let's see. Uh, Redfin launches AI power tool to redesign listing photos. Oh my gosh, that's sort of an older update. Yeah, no, there's no news on Redfin here. I think it's just lower volume and you get a lot more volatility on this. Boeing had their, uh, their conference admitting to mistakes on the... Uh, 737 Max, boy, man, that, that plane has just been plagued. It's just plagued. I still am shocked they didn't rebrand it with a different name. Like, who wants to go on a Max now? Uh, Brett Whitten 
uh, from ARK Invest was casting some shade yesterday. He's like, you know, what are the odds that the seats next to that Boeing uh, door were empty? And he's like, about, you know, two seats in e empty there. It's like about one in 420. And uh, that's an interesting sort of way to suss the idea that maybe uh, maybe somebody knew something was loose with that door or something was going wrong with that door. Uh, and so they, they uh, blocked out those seats from booking. Who knows? But it was an interesting little bit of jade I saw from him. Uh, so I find that very interesting. Yeah, go BTC. BTC sitting at 45. We'll see where it goes. All right, let's see what... Uh, oh, yeah, I also think it'll be very interesting. If we get that BTC approval today, could it mean we'll get an Ethereum approval? Uh, I actually think so. I think Ethereum will be next. You kind of work through the chain. You get a lot of them. So that'll be neat. Yeah, we talked about the SEC hack. We already went through that, so just scroll back. Let's see. After inflation, Dr. Cooper has been looking kind of sick. What? F. Etherman? Oh, somebody here doesn't like ETH. Oh, yeah, let's look at ETH after uh, the announcement. That's a, that's a good point. I like that idea. All right, so let's look at Ethereum. That's a great idea. So we'll want to go to the announcement. So the fake announcement. Wait, do we have this in? Yeah, here we go. It would have been like 1511. Oh, but I have to get my timing aligned because of the time zones. Hold on. So what time zone was that? It was right after the market closed. Bookmarked, I believe. Let me double check. Oh no, maybe it was right before the market closed. Yeah, this has got to be PM 311. Well, let's see, do I have this on Eastern time? This is on, yeah, this is Eastern time, okay. So 1511. No, it couldn't have been here. It had no, yeah, it was right here. Okay, all right. So that is a. Um, I wish they would give a darn time zone, but that's fine. So you can see by the movement here, it looks like it was 11 minutes after Ethereum moves up. Ethereum, uh, 26 minutes after we have news of uh, the hack, which does lead to a temporary drop. But Ethereum actually pumped twice three times, four times after the approval, and uh, now it's trying to break out of 2400. Ah, see, look at that. Yeah, it's struggling on that 2400 line. Wow. Yeah, that's a big one. If we can get Ethereum to break a 24, you know, that might be bullish Ethereum. And yeah, maybe you go long, long Ethereum, short Coinbase. All day long, and it, right. every day it seems like it, it's, it's more people are, or just cannot believe the situation we find ourselves in. And it does play into the, the funding that we're trying to do and funding Ukraine, funding Israel and everything else. What is the, the can you give me a, an outline of the big picture on what we what we're, we need to do and, and what politicians should be doing for, uh, for the people? Well, there's no more, there's no state more negatively impacted than my state of Texas. We have 1200 miles of common border with Mexico, uh, finally, uh, national leaders like the mayor of uh, New York. Oh, this is so boring. So, uh, yeah, I like this comment here. How long until the the rubber band snaps on Nvidia? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, this is a this is a very very bullish uh, breakout, but that doesn't mean it's gonna last. Uh, I mean, now we're getting to where like the fibs just get so much further away. We're getting a little bit. Uh, you know, to the point where it's time to draw some new fibs. But uh, if, if we just draw, oh, let's try to draw a trend here. Uh, can we draw a trend without that line? Yeah, so if I draw a trend without this breakout, 
Eh, no. I can't, I can't really find a good one here. Maybe, maybe some peaks over here, but again, that's just drawing off of this. That's not very predictive. But, it, you know, it is, it is a stock that, uh, that a lot of people are very frustrated by, probably mostly just not not being involved in it. Uh, and uh, the earnings growth is is very exciting, uh, putting it somewhere around like a 1.5, 1.7 peg uh, relative to you know, companies like Apple or otherwise. Uh, wait, is it still under a one peg now? Uh, probably not actually, not with these new prices. Probably actually over two now. Well, let's look really quick. Yeah, because I mean, now we're at, what, 535 in pre-market, 535 divided by 1230, yeah, puts you at about 43.5 divided by 25% EPS growth, yeah, 1.74. Well, that's not, that's not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, but yeah, eventually, eventually there'll be some, some pause, certainly. Okay, Mr. Gundlach, Jeffrey Gundlach. He's the Bond dude. Said Tuesday that he sees a chance of a severe recession coming in 2024. Ooh. And possibly the uh, S&P will start pricing it in sooner rather than later. This guy manages $96 billion. Wow. Highlighted the inversion of the 210 uh, Treasury note yields. Yes. That's generally your uh, scariest bear argument the 10 to yield curve Rawr! let's see where that sits now at the same time we should also look at bonds quickly bonds right now sitting uh eh, still at about four percent teeny teeny little bit under all right let's see 10 to yield curve 10 to we are 34.6 to the negative side. Huh. And let's get our break-evens. We haven't done that in a minute. Five-year break-even. Where do we sit now? Last we were like 2.2. Yep, 2.19. Okay, well, that's boring. And then how about the odds of a raid cut in March? Is it back to a coin toss? It is, oh, wow. The odds jumped yesterday. We were, were getting close to a coin toss, somewhere maybe around 57, 58% chance of a cut in March. Uh, now we're sitting at 70, oh boy, 71.1. That's wild. That's the highest I've seen so far in, uh, uh, in, in sort of the recent weeks here. 71.1% chance of a rate cut in March. So the market's getting more and more convinced, not less. I say it every day that we, I, I just, we just shake our heads at, at the times we're living in center. Thank you uh, and, and, and good luck and, and hope to see you again soon. You had a lot of comments about the BTC ETF. I, I already talked about what I thought the price would do. Um, so, so rewind. Get you ready for the opening bell on Wall Street. As we head to a break, you might see that we have some special guests behind us. We want to say hi to a very special group of young men. This is the Rutgers lacrosse team. Um, this team actually has been ranked in the preseason as number... Yeah, I don't care. Okay, Nick T posted. Nick T, this week's anticipated data release is the December CPI. Wall Street forecasters expect the core 0.3% from November, lowering the 12-month uh, rate slightly to 39 Oh, I expect the core to rise 0.3. Right. And that would bring 12 months down to 3.9. And uh, see, headline up a 0.3, pushing, uh, pushing the 12-month rate up to about 3.3. So, yeah, I think a lot of folks do look at this and say uh, energy is expected to drive some of that headline move up. Uh, Nick T says, despite a jump in interest rates in the third quarter, household debt obligations as a percentage of personal income were a little changed. That's probably one of my favorite lines, by the way, is uh, looking at, um, 
St. Louis Fred, uh, household debt service payments as a percentage of GDP. There we go. Yeah, look at that. Oh, sorry, as a percentage of personal income, not GDP. So anyway, we're at 9.7%, which before the pandemic, we were also at about 9, well, we were at about 9.9%. So we're actually less, that's so weird, less indebted now than the debt level that uh, we had as a percentage of our income uh, before the pandemic. Wild, especially with rates the way they are. And this is uh, debt service payments. So this would increase with higher interest rates, uh, assuming you've refinanced entire debt through credit card financing or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what else? Someone had a rumor that DeSantis might end up dropping out if he loses uh, uh, Iowa next year. Uh, not next year, we're already in next year, my goodness. Soon. <laughs> wow, it's so weird. 2024. Yeah, it's looking uh, January 2024. Oh, yeah, that's right. We're already in that. Ugh. It's always writing down the dates. So messy. Uh, yesterday, Utah finally got some snowfall. Barely got out of there in time. Big old storm rolled in around 6 p.m. Beautiful powder snow coming down starting around like 1 or 2, though. So made the second half of the day pretty epic. Nice, soft, fresh new snow to fall in. Very nice. It's been such a lack of snow this season, by the way. I mean, like, to the point where the memes uh, are, are sadly relatable uh, that you're seeing online uh, about how little snowfall there's been. Uh, it's just such a, such a pull forward of uh, snowfall that it seems like we've had going into last year. So, uh, like last year, took it all. Yeah, here I'll, I'll show, um, put up on screen one of my favorite shots of this and then we'll get back to some of the news here. Let's see. And, yeah, look look on screen, look at that. Yeah, there you go. There's your, uh, there's your skiing this season. <laughs> I thought that was great mile on a lot of these fundamental issues. So inflation is certainly one of them. Getting from 3% to 2% may be bumpy along the path, but we do think we're heading in the right direction of travel. We think especially uh, given what we're seeing in real time in terms of shelter and rent pricing and potentially a softer wage gain profile, that'll help us get core inflation uh, down to a more meaningfully closer 2% uh, level. And then of course, the other parts of the last mile are the Fed. Fed is actually gonna go from probably a pause to a pivot in some time in 2024. Uh, maybe not as soon as the March uh, meeting as a lot of market participants are hoping for, but we do think they're headed towards rate cuts. And the third part of the last mile is in the economy. So we'll finally get an answer on whether we're getting a soft landing, a hardish landing. Um, but in our view, if the economy holds up, which is our base case, we may slow to below potential growth, but we're not heading into any sort of recessionary environment. Um, that is a good backdrop for markets broadly. So if you have a Fed that's cutting rates and an economy that is uh, slowing but not recessionary, uh, markets can look through that and, and perform. And so we see so opportunities. It sounds like you're, you're bullish after what was a pretty bullish year. Would you buy the markets broadly or is there something specific you do? Yeah, you know, look, I think uh, after a 24 percent year, we can't expect a repeat of that uh, indefinitely. 24% uh, in the S&P 500, that is. Uh, but of course, there are opportunities. And I know a lot of the guests you've had on have talked about this as well. But when you think about um, what drove markets in 2023, it was really this barbell between the Magnificent Seven and then cash, CDs, cash-like instruments, were really investors piled into. Now, when we look at the opportunity set for 2024, we are seeing a broadening in that. You know, if the theme of 23 was narrow leadership, we think 24 will be broader leadership. So you want to make sure in your portfolios that you have not only some of that MAG7 and artificial intelligence exposure, but also you yeah. have some of that uh, equal weighted S&P, the S&P 493, um, parts of value and cyclical, uh, even mid and small. Bro, it's just pitching everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the S&P is not gonna do 24% again. I mean, I can't go on forever. Okay, duh. Uh, but you know, yeah, 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 broad-based exposure, and then you want this and this, 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 and it's like, oh my gosh. You can't be wrong then. 
Can't be wrong if you just say everything. I mean, I guess everything could go down. Anyway, I thought this was uh, neat. Um, I, I, I unsolicited comment here on sort of cruise ships, but I saw this. Uh, oh, I went away here. Let me see if it comes back if I play. Oh, nope. There it is. Uh, this is the icon of the sea pulling into Miami, and it looks so huge, which makes you think that, you know, bigger's obviously got to be better, right? No, not necessarily. The, uh, well, one of the things that I found that was really disappointing about going on what I thought, oh, like, oh, it's the, the biggest cruise ship. Got, I got to go on the biggest cruise ship uh, in, in the world. That's, that's so awesome. Got to go on it. You know what I found was so disappointing is that it's, it's not so much that the biggest cruise ship uh, actually is much bigger in terms of stuff to do. It's just more cabins. Like I went on all those slides, I, you know, whatever. But I'm like, it's not, it's not that much bigger than a normal cruise ship from the point of view of like entertainment of what you could do. Except, the elevators are more full. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't. Know, I guess that's just more of a. I don't know. I was sort of disappointed by it. I'm mean, like, really? It's just, it's just taller. <laughs> um, like the deck is the it feels like the same size. Oh, maybe it's a few feet different, but whatever. Um, anyway, uh, thanks Max for sending a a cool screeny over here. This uh, this uh, aligns, by the way, with what we've been seeing. Uh, this uh, here's a screenshot Max sent mentions of weak demand uh, relative uh, to. Um, uh, to previous times for consumer sectors. As you can see, not only has that been exploding throughout the latter half of 2022 and throughout 2023, but it started rising again. New peaks. Sarah's in the office. The details matter here as well, because we know the Fed is watching core CPI, and that strips out food and energy, which is more volatile. And we want to see that year-over-year -year number below 4%. Right, four percent is this sort of sticky double the Fed's inflation target two percent. David, look, there are some reasons to be optimistic. Used vehicles continue to decline. Hotel and airfare, some of those services sectors, components, communication services should continue to decline. But there are also parts of it that are sticky, like shelter and rent, which have which have been slower to moderate in terms of prices. We've also seen medical care costs, insurance costs continue to rise, and that affects the core of the CPI as well. So that's the big market mover. Comes out on Thursday. Otherwise, we'll hear this, this afternoon, 315, from New York Fed President Williams, and there'll be a lot of positioning ahead of this inflation report. Yeah. Uh, you know, and listening to Double Line Capital's uh, Jeffrey Gunlock, I felt oh, like he yeah. was channeling you, Sarah. <laughs> I mean, yesterday you were talking about that, uh, you know, the curve de-inverting, highly suggestive of a recession. He even wanted to talk about the dollar. I don't know if we have it, but we, or with a quote from him, but we can take a listen uh, as he sort of, again, he's always worth a listen. Doesn't mean he's always right. But, uh, yeah. uh, but it was, uh, you know, him saying basically it's highly suggestive of a recession. I think dollar's going to have big problems in the next recession as a consequence of the policies that we run. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, that's that's the general thesis is that, you know, the U.S. has a worse recession than the rest of the world. The dollar will collapse. That does not necessarily mean we're going to have a worse recession than the rest of the world. Might not even have a recession yet. There will be another recession. Uh, what's retro here says prices rising on imported goods. Container prices are rising and container shortages can't be good for the economy. Well, you got to look at the actual stats because the reality is we have more supply of container ships than we had before COVID, or certainly during COVID, that was a disaster. So we have more supply of container ships and there's actually less demand. There's less, there is less demand for goods now than there was, you know, immediately after the, the hit from COVID. So you've got more supply and less demand. Yes, <coughs> uh, freight prices are rising for commutes through the Red Sea uh, and around uh, the Cape of Africa. But that doesn't necessarily mean goods prices are going to increase. Mostly, it just means things are going to take a little longer to show up. But that doesn't even necessarily mean things are going to take longer for the consumer to show up. Because so many companies have so much excess inventory, it probably honestly doesn't matter. Uh, kind of wild to think about that. So uh, I'm not 
Uh, and then even if there were a delay, I'm not convinced companies were able to raise prices. There's another great research piece I was looking at. It's basically talking about how we kind of just pulled forward years of price increases, and now companies will probably just be stuck uh, where they are, if anything, slightly reducing prices, which I thought was a really interesting idea that, that you've just sort of pulled forward years of price increases. The prevailing view is that they won't be sustained and that the Fed can't do anything about this. You know, the, the, the government is going to do it. And, and the U.S. and the U.K. responded yesterday to these attacks. It's certainly a factor we're watching, along with, David, other geopolitical issues. You know, I, I keep repeating this stat. Countries with 60 percent of the world's population are going to be voting this year. We're going to get a Taiwan election in a few yeah. Days. Obviously, we have the U.S. Election. Oh, yeah. Keep in mind, that was not an emergency exit on the Boeing flight. Uh, that was a, it's a plug. So they put seats uh, next to there uh, without that door actually being operable. It wasn't from my understanding, it wasn't an operable door. It was a door that didn't even look like a door from the inside, but it was a door frame. Uh, but it was not an operable door from the inside. That is my understanding key thing this as in this coming year i forget i don't know a bunch of them yeah i, I read bunch. it in a few notes um, uh, we're going to talk to ann bremer and the and money movers about some of the risks including taiwan which is coming up uh yeah elections on sunday uh china stocks by the way hovering just about near a five-year low uh this morning let's talk about this wild ride surrounding bitcoin uh last night the sec as yeah. you may know denying it is approved spot Bitcoin ETF saying yesterday. I still think it's going to get approved today. Stated otherwise was false and that its account on the site had been compromised. Our Eamon Javers was all over this last night and we'll watch it today as well. Morning, Eamon. Yeah, good morning, guys. We got a little new information about the hack of the SEC's Twitter, now X account, last night from a posting by X's security team. Now, remember that, as you say, Carl, in the 4 p.m. hour yesterday, the SEC's official account published a statement suggesting that a Bitcoin ETF had been approved. That triggered Bitcoin prices, but within moments, the SEC said it was not true and their account had been compromised. Uh, moments being 15 minutes. ...posted a statement saying the compromise was not due to any breach of X's systems, but rather due to an unidentified individual obtaining control over a phone number associated with the at SEC gov Sad. account through a third party. X also said that the SEC account did not have two-factor authentication enabled at the time of the hack. Now, that's a standard extra layer of protection, and it's going to raise questions about why the SEC did not take that obvious security step on such a high-profile yep. account. I reached out to the SEC this morning for their side of all this. I have not heard back from them yet. We'll update you as soon as we do. Oh, don't worry. You won't. Uh, anyway, uh, next thing is... Uh, <sighs> I hate this so much. Remember how we pushed the government shutdown to like January, February in two parts? We're in January and February's around the corner. <laughs> so uh, Johnson yesterday said, we got the pedal to the metal on appropriations. The appropriators are all working in earnest. The staff are overworked. Everybody's doing their best to meet the deadlines. Uh, yeah. So uh, here are some options that are being sort of debated. Cleanest option is to pass a continuing resolution next week and move deadlines for the 12-month spending bills to March. This is hilarious. So another continuing resolution, kick the can down the road, and then delay other uh, uh, budget negotiations back to March. The problem is the closer you get to the election, the harder it is to actually pass a budget. And... We're just not going to get a new budget, are we? It's, it's just uh, it's shocking how incapable uh, Congress is of getting things done. Some say completely by design. Some say it's those uh, uncertain times of, of when markets and, and people say, you know, maybe, maybe the government shouldn't be spending more money. That uh, the Founding Fathers basically set up a perfect way to slow things down. Uh, anyway, otherwise, we'd be looking at a January 19th shutdown. That's in nine days. So mark your calendar for some volatility. Next 10 days for government shutdown. Uh, and uh, whether or not we'll actually pass a continuing resolution to get this done. Cyber Awareness Month, hashtag Cyber Awareness Month, which was back in, in October. There's a Gary Gensler tweet that literally says, there's a reminder to secure your financial accounts as well as protect against identity theft and fraud. Remember to set up multi-factor authentication. 
and use strong passwords yeah. or phrases. Also, you know, Eamon and David, the, the SEC has been really on top of this issue of, of cyber security. Yeah. They put in place new rules, I think, that just went into effect that force, you know, public companies to disclose more when they are attacked. Yeah. You know, the SEC is not a public company, but they're going to have to disclose a lot of information here. It raises a lot of questions. That those rules just went into effect in December, Sarah. You're exactly right. And, and a lot of public companies are now feeling under the gun to disclose a whole lot more than they did in the past as a result of the SEC pushing them on cyber disclosures. We're going to have to see now whether the SEC follows its own rules here. They don't necessarily apply to the SEC, but in good faith, will they follow their own rules and disclose uh, exactly what they're as much as they can about what they know about what happened here? You know, how did this exactly happen? Was it... <sighs> Fitch, Fitch analyst, we no longer expect a U.S. recession in 2024, forecasting three rate cuts in 2024. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. All right, what else do we have? So we've talked about Bitcoin inflation, we've talked about the SEC and Ethereum. Lots and lots and lots of talk. Uh, a lot of people getting excited about the refresh for uh, Model 3 uh, coming to the United States. Be kind of interesting. Get some get some new modern looking Model 3s out there. All right, we got here. Max 9 aircraft. The company CEO David Calhoun saying the jet maker needs to acknowledge its mistake in relation to the Alaska Air blowout incident. Phil LeBeau's on the phone. He has the latest for us. Phil. David, we are in the 737 MAX plant in Renton, Washington, where we'll be talking with Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun later today. You mentioned that safety town hall meeting yesterday. If you listen to the audio or if you watch some of the clips that Boeing put out, it is clear what a change in tone there is from Dave Calhoun compared to previous CEO Dennis Mullenberg during the MAX crashes and the groundings that happened in 2018. During the town hall, uh, Calhoun was very frank in saying, look, we need to acknowledge our mistake. Every detail matters. And there wasn't any talking. This was uh, an audience of workers who clearly are impacted by what they saw on the Alaska airplane Alaska Airlines airplane on Friday night. Let me bring you up to speed in terms of the MAX 9 investigation and where things stand. The NTSB is analyzing data. We will not hear from the NTSB probably for many weeks, if not months. This is going to be meticulous work in order to analyze not only the door plug, but also any spare parts that are ultimately found. They're still looking for the quote-unquote bolts that were part of holding that door in place. The bolts. They were never there in the first place. Like, ah, it'll fly without the bolts. Yeah. That's, it's just sus. I, I, it, it wouldn't, it would not shock me at all for data to come out or information to come out that, that they knew some bolts were missing on that plane. And they're like, ah, let's fly it anyway. Yeah, yeah, that'll, that'll look really bad for Alaska Air. All right, how are things moving? Let's go to the pre-market. Okay, Coinbase down 2.7. Apple sitting at 184. Apple slipping a little bit off of those all-time highs. Uh, looking at what's uh, moving up. Hilton, Rocket Lab, Arm, Bill.com, Home Depot, NVIDIA. More NVIDIA. Wow, wild. Uh, Palantir at 16 and a half. Boeing, 226. Look at that drop there on Boeing, though, over the last few months here. I mean, you went from 267 to 226. I mean, for what, what occurred, it's actually not that, that much of a drop. Boeing and how he specifically combats this idea that they put profits before safety. Yeah. That, that's in a, in a nutshell. Now, Dave Calhoun will tell you we are not putting profits before safety. Having said that, Sarah... You cannot deny that there have been a string of incidents over the last several months, some of them yes. involving their primary supplier, Spirit Aerosystems. Some of them are self-inflicted wounds. And so the question becomes, you are the preeminent manufacturer, one of the preeminent manufacturers in the United States with a long and very um, 
detailed history in terms of tackling huge challenges, you've got to figure out how to make an airplane where there's no issues. And that's front and center for Dave Calhoun and his team right now. Uh, very complex, Phil. Uh, look forward to that interview this afternoon. That's our Phil LeBeau on the Boeing story. Yeah, what's interesting about those 737 MAX 9s is uh, most of them actually operate uh, are operated by United Airlines, followed by Alaska Airlines. Uh, that's, that's quite a lot of them. Uh, and then uh, then you get into some of the smaller airlines, uh, Copa Airlines, Aeromexico, Turkish Airlines, uh, SCAT, Iceland Air, and so on. All right. Oh, we're going to commercial. Okay. So what is? So we've covered. Let's look over here. That's Boeing. So again, we covered Bitcoin, government shutdown. Government shutdown madness. Not again. Can we like just have a period of time where there are no catalysts? Can we go like catalyst list for just a while? Uh, Taiwan Semiconductor's fourth quarter revenue beat estimates uh, of a decline as demand for AI players helped offset, offset sluggish smartphone and laptop chip sales. Yup. That doesn't surprise me. I uh, personally lowered my exposure to Apple and increased it, uh, not recently, it's been a while, but increased it to uh, the chip manufacturers uh, or just chips in general. Uh, but uh, TSM's been really stuck around that $100 figure. Really uh, a little stuck in the mud over there. We got about 14 minutes to the opening bell. Let's see. Over the course of 2023, TSMC moderated its capital expenditure plans as uh, consumer electronics faced a glut of unsold inventory. Let's see here. They said they expected their overall business to grow this year and that the company had seen its high-performance computing business boosted by demand for NVIDIA and AMD. Earlier this week, Samsung posted its sixth uh, consecutive quarter of declining operating profit. Yeah, T uh, Samsung does a lot of memory work. Uh, which, that sector's getting beat up a little bit. Getting beat up. Uh, Samsung does a lot of everything, though. All right. A lot of debates about whether we're going into Goldilocks or reverse Goldilocks. Again, still think the BTC ETF will hit today. It'll be interesting if it doesn't. It's it's almost like like that that hacked post looked too good. It, it looked like the SEC had done it. I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up. So it looked like it was drafted by the SEC. That's my take, is that the SEC drafted it. And uh, somebody just moved up the posting of it. Uh, let's see if I can get a screenshot of it. I have one handy here somewhere. Yeah, 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 here it is. I thought this was interesting. It just, it looks so, so perfect. Today, the SEC grants approval for Bitcoin, right? This obviously ended up not being true, but it looks so good with a little classic picture here. Today's approval enhances market transparency and provides investors with efficient access to digital asset investments within a regulated framework. Like, I, w I wouldn't be surprised if the actual release is almost just the same as that. Although now it would look a little weird if they used the, the same one. And the question when something like this happens, and, it, and this isn't the only place or the only time it's happened, but immediate, what happened? You deal with it. You, you get operationally back where you were. It's clear the SEC is operationally back on board, right? And, and let me just address your question. I don't think that this should in any way affect whatever their time frame was for dealing with these ETF applications. Yeah. Right? Because, well, there is some concern that it would push back any approval if, in fact, approval was in the in the offing. What, what, whatever the path is, I don't think it should change because they're up. They're clearly operationally back where they were. They've ad they've addressed this for the moment, and any good business, that's what you do. You address it, and you get operations back in order. Those that's the yeah, first right. thing you do. Which hasn't been done yet, necessarily, right? No, I don't, I, don't think there's a, I don't think there's a continuing compromise of the SEC's Twitter account. Now, what you're going to is remediation. And, and what do you do after you've, you've gotten a handle on this? You get the facts. How did it happen? You communicate with your constituencies. And then you, then you harden your processes so that it doesn't happen again. And that's, that's now the phase that we're in 
from an SEC operation. But don't you standpoint. think there are some ironies here with this happening? The fight with Elon Musk, for instance, about tweeting material information, the fact that Gary Gensler has uh -huh, been hard uh -huh. on cybersecurity risk, that he's tweeted about multi-factor authentication. The Sarah Jade. Yes, for the SEC. Well, I, let, let, let's put it this way. I think it demonstrates that everybody needs better cyber hygiene and constant cyber hygiene. And yes, is there, it, look, <laughs> let, let, let's not, let's not bear that. Is there irony here? Are control systems part of the SEC's purview? Sure. Is market manipulation something that the SEC enforces and deals with? And are, and are both of those at issue here? Yes. Which is why I go back to what do you do? You communicate with your constituencies and tell them what you're doing to address those things. You're, you know, we're talking about what's going on at Boeing. I expect the CEO of Boeing will do a very good job communicating with shareholders and stakeholders. That's, that's the yeah. CEO's job. The, uh, yeah, the cyber hygiene comment was interesting. And regarding recovering the account that quickly, I mean, 15 minutes, I don't know that that's be that big of a deal. I mean, it's just like reset password, you know, and then it goes to your email and then you just reset it. Like, I, I don't know that that's that big of a deal. You have to deal with in a new product and an application like this have been addressed. People understand the, what I would say is the Bitcoin product or if we call it a product, you know, how many Bitcoins they're going to be, how it's mined, what it's costing, how it's trading. Those were, those were issues that weren't fully understood. The trading in Bitcoin globally, really unregulated, has become what I would say is much more efficacious, much more trusted. You have financial institutions that are in the business of surveillance coming in and saying, look, we think we can surveil this market and we think this market is deep enough and robust enough that manipulation is at a minimum. When the when the post happened yesterday, uh, our Bob Bassani was like, where's the press release? I don't see a press release yet. I wonder, do you think news flow from agencies on social media will change? Well, I, I think, I, let's, let's, let's be clear. There were some, I didn't see the post. I've now gone back and looked at it. There were indicia that there was something there, okay? It's not the, it's not usually the first means of communication <laughs> right. for an agency. Usually official agency documents are attached to uh, distributions like this. You know, am I surprised that some people said and ran with it in light of the context and the timing? Of course not. You know, that's what happens. But well, yeah, I mean, of course, well, like if you see the official SEC account tweet it, why, why would you not run with it? You know? Is this really the way the SEC is going to roll out something like this? I don't know. Gensler's pretty active on Twitter. Um, so you say that Bitcoin sh it essentially should be trusted yeah. more. Right. And I just I can't I keep thinking of Jamie Dimon not too long ago saying that if he were the government, he would ban it. Let me let me let me say this. I didn't say Bitcoin should be trusted more. And I'm not saying that Bitcoin is going to be worth a lot or a little. What I'm saying is the dynamics of Bitcoin trading and people owning it are better understood and disclosed. And, and to go back to Carl, are they? I mean, last year was a disastrous year and as far as SBF and and CZ and the criminal charges and the fines, it doesn't, it doesn't feel more trustworthy. Well, I don't think the offshore crypto ecosystem is any more trustworthy. But if you look at those frauds, they weren't involved in Bitcoin per se. The, the Bitcoin distributed ledger, um, as far as I can tell, is operating as it had been intended to from the beginning. So, but have people taken advantage of that and the euphoria, particularly offshore and unregulated places, to do really terrible stuff? Yes, they have. I think look, one of the things that's happening here is you're bringing Bitcoin, but also digital assets, into the regulated ecosystem. Finally, I don't. You don't think uh, if the SEC is about investor protection, mm -hmm. and this one happened to hit at home. But you don't think the communication to the investor community about relying on social media information will change? I, I, it should, okay? Um, we're all about it. Pe people want to slow down communications. They want to regulate platforms. History tells us speed wins, <laughs> okay? So you got to accept speed and do what you can with it to make sure that it's more reliable, make sure that it's more trustworthy. Yeah. We're, we're, we're not, look, we trade here in, Microseconds, right? Right. I, I was actually uh, by here. He's talking about the New York Stock Exchange. Martin. Yeah. Speak to all those interns. Wonderful to see. You know what she said? Learn from your mistakes. 
Well said. Uh, Jay, appreciate you helping us understand. Yeah, anyway. All right. So, look, uh, personally, I mean, just my take on it, I, I think you had the post drafted. Somebody got access to the account, whether it was somebody uh, within the SEC uh, or, or outside the SEC, whatever. I think they just moved up the date of that posting to immediate rather than tomorrow, and they got out of there. They didn't actually really want to, you know, get in there and start changing things and taking full control of the account or whatever. All they wanted to do was move up that uh, that approval post. I don't know, just to either mess with the SEC or whatever, I, whatever. But it is very entertaining to to see the lack of uh, multi-factor authentication on the SEC's Twitter account. One that is indeed what they're always recommending. Uh, but then again, there's also a difference between your Twitter account for most people and like your Gmail and your Google Drive or, you know, Dropbox or whatever it might be. So, some are a little more important uh, than uh, than just X or Twitter. So, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, today's stock market moves are, I think, going to be somewhat muted, mostly because it's all going to be based on what people think is going to happen with CPI tomorrow. I mean, we'll see. But let's take a look at the pre-market here. What do we got in pre? We've got uh, Ethereum still knocking on that 2400 door. You've got uh, Marathon Digital coming down here. Coinbase down a couple percent. Etsy down 1.7. Amex down 57 basis points. into it's down a little bit. Upside, Steelcase, uh, Matterport, Build.com, Redfin. Although not by much, a lot of these. Uh, you've got uh, NVIDIA over here up another 80 basis points. We shall see whether things are going to be very exciting for those inflation numbers. Just 23 hours away, folks. It's weird to think about. In 23 hours, we'll be sitting here talking about uh, the inflation numbers that just came out. Uh, Poly Market now has the ETF approval at 84%. You think they'll delay it, eh? Thoughts on ChargePoint? Yeah, I think ChargePoint's going to go bankrupt, honestly. Ah. Not not uh, not too excited about ChargePoint. We actually uh, done quite a bit of analysis on that one, so we'll see. But uh, yeah, not not very excited. What time will a decision be made from the SEC? Nobody knows. Uh, could be could be after the market closes. Uh, could be before. Who knows? It's whatever the SEC wants. But uh, everybody's going to be watching that SEC Twitter account today for sure. Uh, trying to figure out, okay, are we actually going to get it today? If we don't get it today, there'll be some depression because you'll be a, you'll be kicking the can down the road for a while. So, we shall see. But today is expected to be the delay a day. Yeah, but again, some people think that uh, that hack yesterday might end up delaying the whole approval for a bit. Which then makes you wonder, maybe there were insiders who were, you know, who, who wanted to delay uh, the uh, ETF launch. You know, you got to give Fidelity and BlackRock some more time to take everything over. Oh. Ah, Brandon here says, Bloomberg thinks the approval will happen between 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern time. That's interesting. That's between 1 and 3 p.m. after uh, after the market closed. Yeah, that would make sense. That they'd wait until uh, after the close. So that'd be, be between 1 and 3 p.m. All right. Okay, two minutes to the bell here. And, uh, yeah, I'm very curious to see... Well, I, I don't know if we're going to get much action today. That's... It's the thing. Uh, can we really expect a lot of action leading into uh, CPI? I mean, it, everything's going... Whatever happens today is just going to get either confirmed or unwound by what happens tomorrow morning. Uh, I guess you'll be able to see people's bets, so to speak, today. You know, are people thinking uh, inflation's going to come down more than expected or not? Well, it depends. Uh, how much did the stocks move? And that'll be uh, people's expectations, not necessarily what uh, what the reality will be. One minute now to go until the opening bell. One minute. The BTC emoji was the tell that it was fake. If you look at the SEC's replies right before the approval, 
Oh, and replying to random meme posts. That was the tell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a bunch of... Yeah, well, you know what? The layoffs actually haven't been that bad uh, in terms... I know I see your comment here about BlackRock layoffs. There haven't been that many layoffs yet so far in January compared to what we've seen uh, last year or even the year before. All right, let's get the bail. The opening bell is brought to you by... Okay, well, it should, we should be ringing the bell, like, now. Alternatives and responsible investing. And I'll, I'll do the bell. Ding, 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 ding. Yay, the opening bell. Work to hold 4760 here or so. Um, yeah, 47. Okay. Anyway, what do we got? We got uh, Q's up 12 basis points. TSM's positive. Uh, Nvidia's positive. TBD, what direction we go? Ooh, Enphase had a nice little candlestick down. So did Tesla there for a moment, though. Tesla is positive, whereas Enphase is negative, about 60 basis points. Who's really moving here in the AM? Home Depot, CrowdStrike, Meta, Palantir, NVIDIA. These are the ones moving to the downside. Coinbase, 2.43%. Nice little move to the downside. Bitcoin, we'll watch what happens here. Ethereum, very nice. Very nice. Okay, welcome to the opening bell. I want to I see how Zim is doing really quick. Let's look at Zim. So Zim is uh, uh, roughly flat right now. This has been a big trader stock, by the way. You just have to be careful because the news changes on a dime. Uh, but um, yeah, no real movement here on Zim. NVIDIA is actually moving up even more now. Look at that. Look how solid this looks. That's pulling up the queues. So you're getting enthusiasm going into the open here on, uh, on NVIDIA. No enthusiasm yet on those interest rate sensitive. Tesla went negative. Lost the lead. Lost the lead. Uh, CrowdStrike positive, 1.99. Boeing actually is positive. Yeah, it makes sense. Boeing could be positive. Te just leave Tesla behind. Oh, yeah, look look at this NVIDIA. Just, I'm just going to have to keep moving the chart again. Yeah, at some point, by the way, this stock is just going to get to euphoric levels, and it's just going to make sense to sell it. Like there, There is a limit that this can go. I don't know where that is. Uh, it's probably between six and seven hundred, is my guess. If I had to think about it, uh, that it would certainly be a time to start getting it, uh, you know, trimming a little bit, I suppose. Uh, all right. What else? Uh, Arm Holdings up three point five percent. Wow. I always thought they were pretty overpriced. Arm. Oh, and how's uh, a firm been? Let's see if there's any news quickly on ARM. Uh, Jeffrey says, chip stocks to extend rally. Yeah, no, okay, nothing. Uh, ARM actually did lay off about 70 engineers in China. And then, how's a firm? Yeah, pretty stable at about 44 right now. Okay. Almost 2% now on uh, NVIDIA. All right, uh, let's uh, push the button. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, real estate broker, and becoming a stockbroker, this video is neither personalized financial advice nor real estate advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show should not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purpose of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services which we may benefit from. I personally operate and actively manage ETF and hold long positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuers other than House Act, nor am I presently acting as a market maker. There you have it. Thanks so much for being here. As always, we'll see you tomorrow morning for CPI. It's going to be awesome. We'll see you in the morning for CPI and... Uh, we're going to do the course member live a little bit later today because I want to spend some more time uh, on it uh, going into some of the uh, well, some topics I want to cover. So uh, we'll cover those, uh, but it'll be a little bit later uh, in the morning. Thanks.